and welcome to the September webinar of the Norwegian Force Petroleum System and Organic Geochemistry Group. My name is Balázs Bodic. I'm currently leading this group of informal uh, organization of force uh, focusing on source rocks and geochemistry and petroleum system analysis. And our webinar will be given by GeoMark uh, people today. The title is Subsurface Databasing in the Modern Energy Environment, One Location with Multiple Applications. And I guess basically this complex title will um, explain you how PVT data, typical radio engineering data and geochemical data can be interpreted together. Our two presenters today will be first Catherine Donau, Donau, who maybe I'm present, um, pronouncing it not so correct. Uh, she's the director of the Petroleum Data Products at Geomark Research. And pre prior to Geomark, uh, she worked as a Petroleum System Analyst for several operators, mainly, I guess, in North America, uh, on exploration and also a source of deposition and maturation uh, studies. And also she designed and executed sampling and analytical programs to prove exploration concepts and appraisal programs. And she has um, uh, both production allocation experience in commercial and unconventional settings. And then currently she is uh, doing the uh, pattern system databases at Geomark, I guess, pattern data products. And also Kevin Ferron uh, also joining here. Um, he's been uh, working with PVT data more than 20 years and also gas isotope measurements and flow assurance work. And uh, before Geomark, uh, he was working at DB Robinson Research in Canada. And then also later on, uh, Pencor, and then basically, uh, I don't know how many years at Geomark, and uh, he's the one who developed or created the PVT database, the RFT base at, at uh, Geomark. So basically, the, the webinar works as always, you know, people who are not joining from Norway, so you don't interrupt, please, the presenters. But if you have questions, just write your questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we can read up the questions so you have the chance to unmute yourself and then you ask the questions. So basically welcome. I also switch off my camera and unmute myself and please all of you who join do not interrupt the presenter. And then uh, welcome Catherine and Kevin and the floor is yours to, to show. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Catherine Donahue. Uh, that was an excellent pronunciation. I'm coming here from Geomark and I'll start this first part of the presentation. Again, we very much appreciate your time today and we will try to be cognizant of it. So I will go ahead and share my screen and we will go through this first part of the presentation. My understanding, I've been told most of our audience here today um, are engineers and might be a little bit more interested in what Kevin has to say, but we do think that we have something to share as far as what we've learned through our 30 plus years experience of building and maintaining uh, databases. So uh, that's that's the part that I'm, I'm going to share. Um, and I understand, yeah, we are joining from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon. Um, and we are pleased to have you here. Okay. All right, so as I as I alluded to before, what we're going to be reviewing today is a, a very short piece of who we are so you understand the context of where we're coming from with our experience that we share with you. And then move right into the lesson learned of, we say, 20 years of managing, I'd say 30 plus years of building the database. Um, but for 20 years, we've been offering this as a commercial product as we recognize it is quite a task to get your hands around you know, from our perspective, all the sub subsurface data that we handle uh, today, we'll be focusing specifically on the PVT database itself, which has some nuance and, and questions that, uh, that we've, we've answered on how to handle that over the years. And uh, we will go through a few examples of the applications that we stress uh, are made easier, more efficient, and essentially more effective in your work by having a well curated, maintained, evergreen, database, again, highlighting PVT, and then hopefully we will have some time for questions at the end. The few slides to explain who we are and where we're coming from with this, um, this is essentially describing the four pillars of Geomark research. Originally, we came at this from primarily a geochemical, oil geochemical background. Our founders were a geologist and a geochemist, 
Stephen Brown and John Zumberg, and they were able to put together the interpretive story of significant oils collected from around the world that were provided by various operators who were happy to share them because it's one thing to have a perspective of your own field and your own develop development, but it's quite another when you can put it in the context of the entire basin or petroleum system in which you're operating. So by getting your hands on a significant, a statistically significant number of samples, they were able to build them into these interpretive studies. You may have seen them. Your office may have some in books. I know in the audience, we have some participating members in some of our work that we've done, but that's the origin story of Geomark research. Of course, in order to provide all of the interpretation of those oils, we needed the lab facility that ran all those samples. And this speaks to the databasing side for anybody. We all recognize that it's important to have consistent methodology, consistent reporting, and access to show how consistent that is. Being able to reach out and uh, run reviews on those labs and things like that. So it was quickly recognized the significance of how Having our own resource there. So today at Geomark to handle these subsurface questions that we answer, we have an oil geochemistry lab, we have a rock lab, we have a um, petrophysical calibration lab that sits a little bit separately from the rest of the rock lab. We could have a separate conversation on that. And then we also have a fully um, a, a full PVT lab that also serves as our gas lab. So both the PVT and the gas services are run out of our lab. They sit in three different locations in the United States. We're in Houston, Texas, Humble, Texas, and Lafayette, Louisiana. That Lafayette, Louisiana lab, Kevin will be able to provide a little bit more on detail on what is operated out of there. That's the PVT and gas lab. And it's well situated um, for kind of our backyard of the Gulf of Mexico which I think makes for an excellent analog for today's conversation around the North Sea data set. Uh, we're looking at a long lived, highly prolific petroliferous basin that has multiple source rocks, multiple rev reservoir levels, multiple alteration opportunities and putting all of, trying to get your hand around controlling and predicting forward mo modeling the consequences of all of that is made a lot easier by more extensive and well-maintained database. The fourth pillar, so I've talked about our, our studies, our analytical services, and then the database that we put together from all of that. The fourth pillar I would say that we're very proud of here at Geomark Research is that we continue to ask questions and pursue research topics that are relevant to our industry today. Certainly the definition of our industry continues to expand as we look for all sorts of uh, the energy future. We are not focused only on hydrocarbon research, and we're also not focused only on hydrocarbon development as we continue to look for CCUS applications. I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of the relevance of this PVT data we have, of this geochemical data, the water data we have, the relevance that has towards the CCUS applications that we're currently exploring, and, and additionally, the water and the inorganic uh, data sets that we have that are obviously being utilized today for um, additional rare earth element investigation and things like that. So that was the big slide that you had to sit through to explain who we are. The last thing I will say, you'll see that map on the right. We are worldwide. So although today we will focus and we acknowledge you are, we've, we've been told uh, to stay efficient around talking around the North Sea application, those of us in the geosciences certainly recognize the value of an analog. So we do think that it's important to recognize our data set is worldwide. It comes from all over. So there's, there's very little that we can't speak to as far as questions that may came up, come up over lab data that's been sourced from various different points within the world, different conditions that have been experienced by those samples or that that data set, depending on the different format it's submitted or different government protocols for how that's handled. And then, and that's just sort of the above ground piece of it. From a subsurface perspective, we've seen hot, we've seen cold, we've seen biodegraded, we've seen, we've seen where everything goes according to plan, which is of course is rare, but nice when it happens. Okay. Moving forward, well, let's get a little bit more specific into the database and what we have operate what we have today that again is established after years of learnings of not only what makes a good valuable database, but it's also about how well people can use it. 
I, in my opinion, I think historically, um, in my experience, I come from a few different operators before I landed here at Geomark. And every job I was at, I was tasked with trying to create a subsurface database to end all databases. At the, that point, I would say a lot of times it was seen more as a library and a, le and a reference set. It was not, they weren't usually built to be an active part of the day-to-day -day workflow. And that is usually where it fell short. Geomark has that same sort of learning history. In the past, even our data, our database was, I think the first version was even delivered on a CD. It evolved to a thumb drive but quickly. And today we are a web-based service that can be accessed anywhere, anytime. We can update it and load to it anywhere, anytime. The users can receive that data anywhere, anytime. And that's how most people are working these days. So that's kind of one of those learnings. When designing the database, you do need to be thinking about the end user, that final application, and are, is that part being successful? The database is not successful if nobody's ever knocking on its door and using the data inside. Otherwise, you can have a great museum piece, and there's value to that, but it's not what we really want as far as the database. Um, so, as I mentioned, it's very important to us for it to be available anywhere, anytime for those people who are trying to access it. But on the other level, security is is top of list. Uh, we work in a very competitive industry and we know the first first bit of information can make all of that all the difference in the world. So having secure access and having that tested regularly is very important. Um, our database, again, through our experience, we found the, you know, we will continue to talk about this PVT database and I understand that's the primary interest and most of our operators on the room, um, they have other resources for other data types. But having a single location that has the multiple data types, and in our case, we focused on subsurface data. Um, other other facilities or other databases focus on production data, more of that scale of daily production information. And then, of course, we've got people who focus on well logs or, you know, more of an IHS style database. Um, for us, we, you know, again, we we value that subsurface data, the value you can get from integrating. So not thinking of just PVT, but having the correlating you know, detailed geochemical data with it, having the gas data with it, having the water data with it, and different disciplines all working from that same level, not having to go to multiple places, not having to update multiple different data sets. So we find that to be a significant advantage. Um, in our case, again, the database is best if most people use it and most people are providing feedback. So in our case, we choose, we don't really limit the seats if somebody's um, using our database it's accessible to anybody within the company that's subscribing to it. Again, as I mentioned, we've got a lot of security controls, so we can make sure maybe only different operational teams can see different things. Um, but we, you know, in our experience, when we work with people who maybe only have a small specialist group that has access to our data set, you know, that's great and absolutely their call. We believe in flexibility above all else. But we, we think that, you know, you get the most power from it, having everybody on the same platform using the same data and, and not really keeping these data sets in sort of an ivory tower separated from everybody else. Um, and then along those lines, and certainly in the last five years or so, the connectability, uh, connectivity of these data sets and having, you know, skipping the middleman, reducing the, the steps that it takes to export out um, and instead be able to just directly tap into your data and get to work. Everybody has the story or, you know, the, the, the saying of you spend 80% of your time in this business looking for the data and organizing it and when only 20% working on it, right? Um, we try to reduce that by making our, our data set instantly accessible where you want it to be. We'll highlight a few of those sort of suggestions later on. Okay. Uh, oh, and then lastly, for data loading. Uh, database is only as good as the data that's been loaded into it. So. A lot of what we'll share with you today is some of our learnings as you consider um, what you might be looking for moving forward, um, what you might encounter in loading data sets, um, especially something like PVT, where having an apples to apples comparison is pretty difficult, but very important. Okay, so that's kind of the introduction piece. Now we'll just go ahead and roll up our sleeves and share some of the tips and tricks that we've learned. Um, as you guys may or may not know, we've got a couple of our Geomark team over there visiting and they've had the opportunity to sit down with many of the, of the operators over there. And it seems quite clear that there's a, a very strong interest in ha having a reasonably comprehensive North Sea PVT database. 
Um, so how how is that going to look? Um, how is that going to get started? Uh, we took the approach today. We'd like to sit down as if you are a friend saying, hey, I've got this idea. I want to make a, a PVT database for my backyard, the North Sea. What kind of advice do you have for somebody who's who's going to get started there? Um, and that I'm going to just go through a few top of mind things that we think you should think about as you start to move into that world. Um, and this is all based on our experience. But Okay, so our first point to cover is that the metadata for the, the contributed data sets that operators are obligated to hand over, say to like the NPD or in the US, it could be the DOEM um, or BSEE. It's they're very seldom fully complete on that metadata, right? So, um, sorry to go forward. Um, that that we're, we're usually missing some context and some detailed information. So when the lab report is written, whichever lab maybe performed the service, if it was a discovery well, if it was an exploration well, it was probably a pretty important well they kept pretty tight. They they likely didn't provide all of that information to the lab. So if the report is just handed over as a submission for the, the data release requirement, it's not necessarily going to, to contain all of the metadata that's going to be significant for figuring out exactly where it is, exactly where did it drill, so that it would be more useful in the in the future. So all of that geographical information and, and metadata, we'll call it associated or ancillary information, is going to be really important for later on when you're trying to filter by certain reservoirs or ages or things like that. And it doesn't usually come in the first pass. So there's always effort to make sure that you're able, when you're loading the data, you're able to put it in the right context so that other people can use it. So, so, so uh, I would say for GeoMark, one of the things we do is we make sure we've kind of framed that out first before we start populating the technical data behind it so that we can do our due diligence, do some research, make some calls uh, to figure out what the, the framework on the metadata piece should be before we get too far. Because um, it's really not helpful to have a whole bunch of what looks like would be great data, but you have no idea where it came from or what the context is. Okay, the next one is um, there's, as we all know, there's no standardization of the reports that are submitted. So in particular, the units of measure. So they can be depending on the lab where it came from, um, even if it, it's, we're not even talking just imperial and metric, right? Um, once you get even into trying to figure out locations and the lat longs, what coordinate system was used. And then even if you think you know that at least you're in feet, it could be US feet, it could be international. Um, and that's just, of course, for the locations. When we get to the data itself, then there can be, of course, um, there's, there's all different uh, measurements and units of measure that can be used. Some of them are more appropriate than others. Some of them, uh, so, some of them kind of don't exist anymore. They were related to techniques that aren't necessarily used anymore. Um, so it's certainly an important thing to to keep in mind um, when you embark on loading these data sets. Um, I guess the other note I would make on this is for our workflow, one of the things we've learned. So it's it's one thing to read through the data that you're loading very carefully carefully and make sure you have an understanding of what unit of measure was used. But then how, what are you, are you going to choose to load it as was reported? Or are you going to choose to standardize everything within your database, clean it up, put it in one consistent system, and then whenever any of that data is extracted, you know it's kind of coming from the level platform. This is the sort of thing as you have these discussions, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to, to do that. Uh, but I would say my advice is to always think of the end user. And one of the things we have found at GeoMark is it does make, it's made more sense for us to take the approach of basically standardizing everything when we do the, when we load it. So you will have people who, you know, in our process, we're going to have people who are QCing all these reports, so understanding all the relevance of the data and that it's appropriate. They're recognizing what those units are, and then we're going to convert them into our standardized system in our database. And then the end user has the option to request how those units are reported. It's not that the conversions are too complicated or too hard to program into. It's just making sure that everybody is aware of what they're controlling and therefore has better context for what they're using. Okay. All right. 
Um, the next little tip is about um, also about you know not only are the the units of measure not not standard, but also the naming conventions aren't standard. I kind of sometimes will blame some of the geoscientists for this, but between the different kinds of formats of the data report, um, the the different kind of uh, local definitions um, from from different labs for the different style of analysis that's being done. Uh, there's also issues, of course, even if you do get the metadata, not everybody uses, you know, people use code names for their formations. Um, there can be, depending on if you're looking for a worldwide definition, uh, you might use an international age classification, but you might, other groups might be using something more regional. So all of those things are certainly um, another complicating factor to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing we'd like to talk to is really more of the automation issues as well. So a lot of people are under the impression that, oh, data loading these days should just be really quick. We've got computers that can handle all that. And with the advent of OCR and some of the uh, ability to digitize, take some of these old paper reports and, and put them into a, a digital format, we should be well set. Um, the problem as always with these technologies is you just need to use them carefully. So from our, again, our, our little tip there is yes, in some cases, OCR and some of these tools have been helpful for getting over certain parts of the data loading aspect, but it doesn't do everything. It is not necessarily very efficient at understanding subtle changes. Uh, if somebody just added, uh, or if, if a reference to something as simple as whether it's in measure depth or, depth or sub C depth is put on a page earlier, the machine doesn't necessarily recognize anything other than depth. And if you didn't have somebody that's checking and QCing that, and you just thought that the machine was doing a great job reading it in and like, oh, depths are depths. It's, you know, you, you have the usual checks in place to make sure units look good and that it was kind of oriented. You know, there's, there's little logic checks you can build into the system that are great. But again, something so simple as having the, the discussion of that data type on a separate page um, can mess that up as well as the fact that a lot of the shortcuts people try and take is they'll just go through these reports, pull out all of the digits, all of the reported data, and they take all of the, all the pictures, all of the text, and they put them in a separate pile. And you've really lost a lot of what can potentially be a high, the high resolution and detail there. Um, so that last point, all of this is learned from a lot of experience and experience on different reports, different reporting styles. So as again, as you as you get started with this project and thinking about how you want to approach it, it just definitely recommend recognize that it, the more experience you have with it will make a difference in deliverability. Okay. I think we just have a couple more here and then we'll be moving on to Kevin. Um, the next point, these fragmented reports. So uh, pretty much like I was just talking about with these reports sort of are taken apart and put in different pieces. Um, it's not necessarily a surprise to just see a portion that was reported. Um, different, different reporting requirements mean you don't necessarily have to share the entire test or the entire experiment of the data. So you'll only see a portion of it. And sometimes mistakes are made and some critical information was not included with the part that were, was, was provided. So yes, you'll have some really sporadic data that, that is very difficult to tie back, but it's important to make the effort. This is very, much where it comes into play to have a comprehensive data set that's got different data types, especially in something like PVT data, you'll see um, something that was labeled as a PVT data set, and it's only a portion of it. If there, you can find the other half in something that was labeled, you know, geochemistry, and you might have more composition information in there. So if you were only looking with one set of eyes, you wouldn't recognize the fact that there's the whole data set is completed. It's just it's just existing in different places and you have to have somebody recognize like, oh, this actually does combine. I've done some due diligence. I can check the dates. I can confirm this was all originally from the same report at the same time, same lab. You know, you can go through all of those steps. Um, but again, it that, that takes some effort. So, so that needs to be noted as well. Um, and then let's see the differing volume of tests. So some of the key learnings about the the different styles and uh, associated data with some of these these experiments. At GeoMark, we kind of lump them as fixed standardized tests. It's kind of you know that I'm not wouldn't get too specific on the number of of tests they have, but they kind of live in these different families. 
um, you know, some that are going to represent more reservoir conditions, some that are going to be more in a production or a surface condition, that sort of thing. Um, but the associated information that can come with them or the number of experiments that are run within that context can vary. So, for example, um, we may have space for 20 CCE tests within that same, that same sample. Uh, maybe years ago, people wouldn't have been running 20 of them. Maybe they would. But we, like, we've learned you need to be ready to prepare for loading that, that, amount, of, that amount of data, thinking about it as that, that volume of reporting that may come with that. Um, and that's going to very much change depending on the age of these of of the reports that are given. And again, as you start moving into the North Sea work and loading it all, <laughs> the North Sea has, of course, been um, the providing resource for the world for decades. So you will be experiencing a lot of the issues that come along with looking at these different vintages and then evolution of the tests that are run and that for the templates that would change and the volume of data that is associated with it. Okay, um, and then, then this next one is about compositions. Um, so the idea that the compositions, they, they definitely have the highest amount of variability at that, that uh, high level, I would say, the different labs and how they report the composition information. So whether you're measuring out to just uh, C7 plus versus C30 versus C36. I think some st stuff is C27, you know, so you'll need, that is not going to be standard and that's going to be highly variable. And of course, has a lot of context for how things are going to be grouped and used moving on. So all of the raw data is important and it all counts. But when we think of, again, the end user and what they're going to be grabbing, it's going to be important to make sure everything is very clearly labeled and any dependencies on summations of those sets that are going to come from that data will need to be uh, carefully communicated and reported as such. Um, so, and then there's also just been, I guess we talk about different vintages of data. There's an evolution of what has continued to be included. So the increase of, of BTEX parameters, you've also seen increases, you know, like amount of water reporting that is done, um, you know, some additional detail that comes into play when you look at these over time. Uh, just as much as that, amount and the, the style of that composition data changes, certainly the order of it changes as well. So these are these are certainly things you can overcome with some reasonably capable programming to check for this kind of template and that order and things like that. But you you need to make sure that you you've accounted for it and that you know that it will it will happen. And I'm sure this is not new for a lot of the people in the room who've read these different vintages of reports and use this information. But imagine now you're going to be putting yourself in the shoes of the, the person who is building this database and loading the data is very likely not going to be a reservoir engineer. They're likely going to be a programmer or more of a data processing style person, maybe a lab person, and they don't necessarily have your perspective and years of experience. So you're going to need to put some guide rails in there to make sure that you're maintaining the quality and fidelity of the information that you're excited to use moving into the future. Um, I think we're at our last one. Um, so all of this work can be, uh, all of the analysis and, and work that you're going to be doing in the future will be expedited if all of that data is captured correctly. So as much as I just went through a list of things to be aware of and be cautious of, we also really want to promote, it's a great idea. It's going to allow you to work better, faster, and that generally means less expense, which all of the managers like to hear. Um, but yes, it's the right thing to do and it can be done. And again, we, we've, we've sort of been there. Uh, while we're happy to help and advise uh, and consider us, please, moving when you're, when you're putting this plan together, um, it is absolutely wor worth it and you will have, um, re your rewards will come back to you as you try to, as you start to apply the data set to your day-to-day -day needs. So whether you're talking about some fluid characterization work and moving into production allocation and production optimization, um, things like uh, uh, CCUS and the um, carbon dioxide sequestration sort of work, um, all of it is improved by having an integrated comprehensive data set. Uh, so, you know, specifically what kind of data, the way, you know, we're using in this case, our database, an example for what kind of information you're pulling out, how it's organized and how that end user could expect to go in and look for it. You can see the detail of making sure everything is captured. 
where you don't want to go through this effort and stop at a very cursory sort of summary level. That may be useful for one or two things. And and it, I'm going to go or the, as a data person myself, as an interpreter, I'll take something over nothing every day of the week. Um, but if you're going through this effort, capture it all, capture it in detail and capture it in a format that's usable. Make sure people would know where to find it. Try and stick with sort of the, the most common name. The advantage of doing something at a proprietary level for just your company is you can use your naming conventions and you can use your workflows to describe where to find the data. As we move towards a more international and global system, you're looking, you know, people are looking to redefine things in a more universal format, which is brilliant and beautiful. But you know, at every company, there will be people who can't let go of their proprietary nomenclature because it means something to them. And it also means other people don't know what you're talking about. Um, so you might want to be thinking about sort of a dual system. Uh, I think the organization, so like uh, what's going on with OSDU is an excellent example of a fantastic way to work with that. So as we support some of the OSDU efforts and we come to a more universal discussion schema format and agreement, uh, you, there still should be room for some proprietary structure um, and work products that can be created from that. So no effort that you would put into creating a North Sea PVT database at this point would be wasted with just a little bit of thought about how it might connect to you know, other data sets, other databases, other data frameworks. Um, but then, you know, I'm gonna say it a million times, keep that end user in mind of how they're actually going to be using that data in the future. Okay, so um, I think that uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward this last, the, this last point kind of gets to that comment I made in the beginning about you don't necessarily want to be a library. You want to be more dynamic and you want to be a player. So you want to think of that database as a member of your team, not just a vault. Uh, so think about how how much of it you're capturing. Think of the like document management and the original um, the original ancillary data that can be stored. Think about where you're going to store some of the associated PDFs and things like that. Um, but keeping it all in that centralized location where everybody's aware of where it is and how to get to it and be able to make comments to it. The very last point, and okay, so in this case, this is an example of how we think it's important to make sure your database connects out. Um, Spotfire is a popular tool with a lot of our users, so we've opted to build a connection where you know you can just link directly into Spotfire to our database. Our database, uh, by the way, is just a, an Azure SQL format. So. You can do so much with so many of the, the um, options that are already out there. Uh, but you know, we we pick Spotfire. We also have a, ver a version in Power BI. We can build the API connections to anything. We make sure it's the point is we want to meet the user where they are. In your case, it may your user groups may be different teams within your own company. In our case, they're usually different companies themselves. Um, but it's very important to make sure that you can get the data out and that you can keep that data refreshed and relevant and present for the, the most up-to-date questions that the user has. And that's the very last point is just remember the uh, this process is never finished because it isn't a library. It is not a vault. This is not gonna be a monument to data that was collected in the North Sea. It's going to be an active project that will require active maintenance. That means active personnel and associated costs. Building intelligently at the beginning will minimize those longer term costs or building in like a consortium effort where everybody is sharing those costs that will really allow you to get further, faster, with higher quality by thinking about it in that perspective. But you want to make sure you are able to capture advancements in data acquisition and data application and that you don't end up with something that is out of date and again like the kind of thing that your users work around instead of with you absolutely you don't want to waste all this effort there okay so now i'm going to just skip through this so we can get to where kevin is going to pick up i just had popped in a few slides that speak to how we integrate our current north sea data set making sure you like we can have the the pbt talk to the geochemistry but I think in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and switch over to, to Kevin and um, he can take it from here to talk through some more specific examples. So thanks for everyone's attention.
Thanks, Katie. And if you okay just to forward the slides for me, I think we'll just leave you with control, please. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So what we've got here is uh, uh, this is sort of a bit an ongoing project we started around the same time as we were developing the PVT database. You know, with GeoMark's history of of being a geochemical lab and my background as a PVT person, you know, we're we're often trying to make sense of PVT data not even putting it in a database yet, but just does the data generated in the laboratory make sense? Does it make sense near to, you know, in context of nearby wells? So this was a project that we worked on in the Gulf of Mexico where we were able to collect PVT data. Some of it was uh, months old, some of it decades old, and also collect a sample, a physical sample of a stock tank well that we could run geochemical analyses in our laboratory, trying to tie those two together. So if you go to the next slide, please, Katie. Yeah, so this is sort of a good one as, as part of many, many graphics, but just to sort of give you a general idea here. <clears throat> the, I'm not, as I think as Katie mentioned, there might be mostly engineers in the room, and I'm an engineer, but sort of a, a very amateur geochemist. What we're looking at here is the bar down the left-hand side of this table. Those are different families categorized geochemically mostly based on the source rock that generated the hydrocarbons. Okay, so what we like to think of when it comes to PVT data is the driving force of PVT properties, the source rock that generated the hydrocarbons, how thermally mature did they get? So the hotter the source rock got, generally the lighter the fluid gets, the higher the GOR, the higher the API gravity. And then there are alterations that happen. So across the bar on the top, the M term, is for thermal maturity, M123, increasing thermal maturity. Another part that makes a difference to PVT properties is, is there any biodegradation once the fluids hit the reservoir? Bacteria eating away at the fluids, making them thicker and heavier, removing the paraffin, the lighter compounds. And then the one part we also don't have on this one, the final real characteristic that drives PVT data, we can really pick up in the PVT database is the presence of biogenic gas in the reservoir fluid. So there's the difference between thermogenic, thermally generated hydrocarbons coming from a source rock. That's all the data that we see on this one. And many of the fluids we have in offshore Gulf of Mexico and to an extent in the North Sea have biogenic gas, background methane already in the reservoir as the fluids migrate up into the reservoir from the thermogenic source. And that extra methane makes fluids much lighter higher GOR, doesn't affect API gravity because it's just methane. API gravity is a stock tank oil number. But anyway, what we're able to do with this chart here is if I just pick a row here, for example, right across the top in red, row A. And so these are averages for many of the PVT. We went to the PVT reports and looked at the API gravities and compared them to geochemical classifications that we've got there, M1, M2, M3, the top three um, cells with no biodegradation and increasing thermal maturity does what it's supposed to, makes the API gravity lighter. For in the Gulf of Mexico section, that is as we get closer to the shelf, that's the place where it's the higher thermal maturity and it makes for lighter fluids. When we get to the much deeper section, we have lower thermal maturity and that's like the next two over, the M1 and the M2. A is all a family that's near the shelf. You can see the effect of what happens with biodegradation. A little biodegradation moves the API gravity down into the third mid 30s. Heavier biodegradation moves it down. So our net thing that we do with these is both make cross plots, but especially map them. Make these matrices for GOR and bubble and dew points and especially viscosities that we start making things or try to make them become a little more predictable. That's the hardest part with PVT data. Um, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the next reservoir down in the same well or in this next well over in the same field because of this change in thermal maturity doesn't happen much nearby but the presence or lack of biogenic gas and biodegradation those two variables change and that's why pvt data is so sort of hard to predict ahead of time and why we use these matrices to try and eliminate those variables when we can Okay, next slide, please, Katie. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so then when I mentioned it sort of in a map basis, this is the heaviest one that we use for sure graphically. And the biggest advantage of having a, a standardized database. So uh, I sort of can't mention this or, or reaffirm what Katie said more strongly. Uh, when you have a look at PVT data from different laboratories, the tests are almost all the same, but how they're displayed will look different. Or anytime we let the pressure off in the PVT world of something, we refer to that as a flash. And some labs will call that a zero flash, and some will call it a single stage flash or a reservoir zero flash. Sometimes they'll do it in multiple steps instead of a single pressure step. And when you're trying to compare those GORs or formation volume factors or saturation pressures, getting them standardized is for sure the most important thing that we do. Once that's done, you know, in a typical PVT report, there might be 30 or 40 pages full of numbers. <coughs> But you're really trying when you're looking comparing fluids to gather out, I don't know, the key six or 10 or 12 numbers to compare them to. Okay. I do this a lot in the PVT database, take that entire PVT data set, but then grab the what we refer to as the headline data and export that out for tens or hundreds, sometimes even thousands of samples, and then prepare cross plots like this. Okay. So this one's a simple couple that we use just comparing reservoir fluid molecular weight. That's really a summarizing of a composition that Katie showed. How much methane, ethane, propane, we use that to calculate the molecular weight. Some properties correlate beautifully, like the shrinkage factor on the left-hand graph. And that doesn't matter where you are on the planet. If we have this in the North Sea or Gulf of Mexico, it's that tight, that sort of correlation. So right away when we're validating a PVT report or something like that, or composition data, you compare it onto this graph. There are other things this one here is a little more complicated on the right, this reservoir fluid wetness that's on there. Still molecular weights are composition based. The wetness is a composition based also. How much ethane through pentane, C2 to 3,5 is in there, divided by C1 to C5. And that changes a bunch depending do we have the thermal maturity and biogenic gas, those two. We can have fluids that have very similar properties but different compositions, depending if they've gone through this history. If they've gone through this complicated history, then they'll have a different viscosity, a different GOR, a different bubble point, especially. So we use this a fair bit for screening to try and say, does the PVT data make sense? And why is my fluid the way it is? And really that's the way many of our customers use it too, is even in our own PVT lab, if I generate data that looks odd compared to the analogs around the world, well, then we try and go figure out the reason why. So the, the predicting ahead of time, there's some basins that's very good, some it's more difficult. Probably just as importantly, does this data make sense that's newly generated, whether you know I generated it in my laboratory or if a, another lab around the world did it, you know, we quality check it, does it make sense? Good. Now, does it make sense relative to other fluids around the world or is there something crazy going on? So that, that kind of usefulness of comparing and, and integrating the data we found, um, you know, both for our customers and especially for ourselves, a, a real useful part of the database. Okay, Katie, next one, please. I think that's mine. Yeah, I think that was just the, the short bit that I have. And if, if anybody ever has an interest in, you know, longer presentation on those ones, I'd be happy to send them over, or I think Graham might be over there with you. We, we've got more materials, much more in depth if anybody would like to see them at another time. <laughs>